it took everybody by surprise because nobody thought of me as, as having at, at 12 or 13 by the time I signed the contract of actually having a career. I mean, I was just the kid at home. Well, we'll kick it right off. Um, congratulations on the book. I'm really enjoying it. Uh, it's it's a lot of fun, uh, and it's uh, you know, as a longtime fan, to just kind of get your interior perspective on things is really fascinating. Uh, <clears throat> maybe we can Thank start you. by maybe we can start just by talking a bit about like why did you decide to finally write write the book? It it was it was it was just the right time. I thought about doing it for a long time, and it was just the right time. And and I know it seems as if I've waited a very long time, but it does sometimes take some people a long time to make sense of their lives <laughs> and make sense of their childhood in particular. Um, uh, but it was triggered by the meeting I had in California, in Hollywood at the Disney Studios when I had lunch with Howard Green. Uh, and. Uh, I met a lot of wonderful people who worked at Disney and realized that apart from two people at the lunch, I was the only one that actually had known Walt himself. And then I was taken up to his office, which they completely put back together again. And it was like walking back 60 years. It was just extraordinary. And then I was given access to the archives and, um, and spent days just going through my boxes, my folders, my letters. Oh, I say my, I mean, you know, because they were in my folders. So they were they were letters between myself and Walt and, and my mother and Walt Disney and my it, all of us. Uh, it was just an extraordinary kind of treasure trove. And um, when I got home, my family said, you really must write about it. And I said, well, I'm not a writer. I, you know. I, I've always, I've always written. I've always wanted to write, but but actually to you know, take it on board and sit down and say, right, I am now going to write my memoirs. That was something quite different. And then my my eldest son Crispian said, well, I'll help you. And I, I can't tell you what a difference that made because I knew he would, I knew he could, and so we sat down. And the timing was extraordinary because it was just before the lockdown. <laughs> and um, I think we're all going to say in years to come, well, where were you when the lockdown happened? <laughs> you know, And um, I was very, very lucky because by the time the lockdown happened, I'd already written the, the prologue and, and a couple of chapters. And with Crispian's help, had mapped out the shape of the book and um, miraculously had found a literary agent and a publisher. So I was sitting um, at my desk um, and that's what I did during lockdown. Yeah. I just, I just uh, scribbled away. You tell a really funny story um, early on in the, I think it's the preface to the book perhaps um, where you talk about um, the, the fancy Oscar ceremony when you won the won the um, the juvenile Oscar award, and then it turns out you weren't even there. You were asleep at boarding school and didn't even yes, know what was yes. going on. Uh, so and, you know, it struck me that that sort of like perhaps illustrated the balance that you had that you had to strike as a child actor, and that you still had to live a, a normal life as well. It, what was that like trying to you know be a regular kid and then also go off, jet off to Hollywood to make movies with Disney and so on? Well, it was perfectly simple for me in the beginning. It just got, it got tricky as I got older. You know, th life is very simple for most children. They accept their situations, good, bad or indifferent. They accept it, you know, we're like dogs. We just, that's it. It was just when I got older, it got tricky. And um, as far as I was concerned, I just slipped into one life after the other. You know, there was the life of, of my, my boarding school 
Uh, then there was the life in Hollywood where I was making a movie. And then there was the life, you know, on the farm, just riding my pony and being being normal. And I, and I think that that was, um, I just I sort of picked it up and put it down again and then picked it up, put it down. Um, because I was familiar with this world. When I when I was born, my father was a was a big film star. He'd all all my life he'd been a big film star. All his life he'd been a you know he had. Um, he was one of those extraordinary people, very lucky, very exceptional in so many ways that uh, you know he just became a star early on and stayed there. It was like. That was his natural place to be. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I knew the world, you know. I knew the, I knew the, I knew the job. I knew the work, and it didn't, it it didn't have any great. I knew it as work. Right. Uh, and because that, that's what my father did. That was his work, and so then it became my work, and then all the perif- all the peripheral things, you know. That's that's just something else or the, the glamour that people see and think that that's what it's all about. Because I don't think people really do think that. But um, I mean, they know that there's, there's that everyday hard work involved. But the glamorous bits are what people see. And I think the glamorous bits are what attract a lot of people uh, to that life in yeah. the beginning. You know. Sure. Yeah. And you, I guess. Yeah, but you'll just offhandedly mention in the book how, like, you know, your dog was Vivian Lee's dog. Uh, and, you know, like, you had this, where you'd go vacationing at Rex Harrison's house, or, you know, like, you you had this sort of just, you know, natural connection to the that sort of that sort of side of the life, I guess, that you just took for granted, I, I suppose. Um, but um, I have to say, just as a quick aside, because you mentioned your dad uh, many years ago, I worked on the QE2 and you were sailing on board with your dad. Um, and I just remember seeing you, your dad was quite old at the time, I think. And I remember seeing you um, helping him to the theater. I think you guys were maybe going to do a speech or a presentation or something, um, for, you know, on, on, in the theater on board. And uh, I just remember being so struck by, you know, how you were taking care of your dad at that point. Uh, and it just seemed like such a nice moment. So I just wanted to mention that to you. Uh, because it was uh, it really stuck oh, with me. Oh wow! How what a lovely lovely thing to hear. What year was it? What what were you doing? It must have been the mid nineties, around nineteen ninety five ish, I guess. Um, I worked on board. I was the I was the chap who ran the TV system on on the ship. Oh, I love that! I love that. that yeah. Sorry, my mum was quite. My mum, my mum was having some problems because um she 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 didn't she wasn't as fortunate as my father that old age really challenged her a lot yeah. whereas my dad although you know he 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 lost his sight and he was as deaf as a post he th- there were things that could be done about hearing aids and glasses and all he had all that well, but my mom became confused right yeah yeah and that was a that was her struggle um and um yes i remember that trip very well how lo- how lovely did we yeah. actually meet i, no. I, I you, well you, you so you actually um you asked me because i was wearing the uniform because i worked there and so you you asked me for directions to the um to the theater I think you'd gotten off the lift maybe and you were you guys were trying to find your way around to the theater and um, right. and I sort of pointed you to where you needed to go and then for the now for the past 25 years I've always regretted that I didn't just help you walk you guys <laughs> to the theater uh, and I think I was so intimidated in, in the moment I didn't even think of it you know it was like it's <laughs> Haley and John Mills you know so so I apologize for not helping you guys along to the <laughs> <laughs> 25 uh, years later, how sweet. Oh, <laughs> so, nothing uh, open. Nothing yes. open. <laughs> uh, so uh, you uh, you talk, you know, obviously you talk a lot in the book about about Walt Disney and and, um, and you, you tell a fun story about your first meeting with him and 
uh, with the dog and uh, your mom brought the dog along and all. Um, and then it became this, this thing where you, you know, the Disney contract became the question for, before you signed on for Pollyanna. Pollyanna. Um, yeah. did, when you look back on it now, you know, knowing what you know now, or would you have changed that? Would you, would you have not signed the Disney contract? I mean, just in terms of your career as an actor, are you you're happy that you did, did it the way you did it? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I would be an absolute fool uh, to regret that. It was the most wonderful opportunity. The problem was that, that it took everybody by surprise because nobody thought of me as, as having at, at 12 or 13, by the time I signed the contract, of actually having a career. I mean, I was just the kid at home. You know, that was it. And suddenly you know, my parents were faced with this huge decision and a terrible responsibility whether to, you know, allow me to sign the contract and therefore have a life mapped out, this acting thing. I mean, I remember my father saying, well, do you, do you want to, do you like acting? I mean, do you want to do it? And nobody had even asked me that before. And I think I, put, I write about it, um, you know, and, and I thought about it and I thought, Yes, I do. I love it. But the thing is, it was, it was, you know, the only thing I, I, I realized that, that was so difficult for me was being under contract and going through adolescence and losing my confidence and not able to get out of the contract. So I just had to kind of tough it out and carry on when all my instincts were saying, I just want to go into my bedroom and shut the door. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and um, uh, so I, I did feel trapped at one point, but it taught me, I think it toughened me up. Yeah. I think it was a lesson about you make a commitment and you have to see something through to the best of your ability. And just because it gets difficult and you're not enjoying it as much as you were, well, hard cheese, you just got to press on. And uh, I think that was a good, uh, I think that was a very good lesson. So, I mean, you, <laughs> you obviously had a great effect on you know, generations of uh, movie fans, you know, who grew up, grew up on everything from, you know, Pollyanna and the Parent Trap to, you know, your later work and then into, you know, stuff like The Flame Trees of Fika and then Good Morning, Miss Bliss. Like there's, there's like decades of work that in, that created a fandom for you. And you talk in the book about your first, you, you, your family went on a, a tour of the Far East, a promotional tour, and it was your first kind of exposure to the like fandom of people tearing at you and you, you losing your shoe and, you know, like getting pushed into the elevator, like, yeah. how, how, would, how had, did you adjust to that experience? Because I would imagine to this day, you still have to deal with it. I mean, you have people like me coming to you, telling you stories about, you know, the one time I glimpsed you 20 years ago, you know, like, like, did it become a thing that you really had to learn to deal with? Did it ever, was it ever a problem for you to deal with that fandom? No, it wasn't because, I mean, it was, you know, it was astonishing when it happened, uh, but on an individual level, you know, fans are nine times out of 10, wonderful, friendly, sweet, generous. Um, and it's, it's, an, it's a marvelous experience to be on the receiving end of people's happiness, you know, and frankly, delight at seeing you and telling you how you and, you know, they feel that they grew up with me and that the, the films that I made were so important and, and, and helped them through their childhood and, and things like when they feel miserable now as adults, sometimes they put those films on and it makes a difference to how they feel. The only downside of that is um, 
when people get a little bit, well, for example, I've been stalked a couple of times, which is a rather scary experience, you know, and um, the first time, well, I told you, I mean, I, I write in the book about the burglar at the farm who turned out three weekends in a row. And the final weekend, my, my little brother was asleep upstairs in bed, you know. Um, and then there was, there, was, there was one guy that uh, kept turning out when I'd moved to London and um, uh, in my, little, my first little flat in Chelsea. And he kept turning up in the middle of the night and standing outside my front door. And there was one night when the, there was a, a power cut and I'd come back from the theater and I was going up these very narrow winding stairs up to the sixth floor and there was no light and I walked straight into him. And it was very nerve wracking and I finally had to get the police to come and, you know, take him off and um, he had to go to court and all that's horrible to have to do that. Um, so that side of it's a bit, there is, you know, there's, there's, and then you think about what happened to John Lennon and you think about what, what happened to George Harrison, you know, that, that how people's, and I'm not saying this about myself, but you know, how people's obsession can, become very dangerous yeah. to themselves and to the person that they're, that, that, that they're obsessed with. Um, because there's a certain, um, you do feel a responsibility to people. Yeah, for sure. And, um, they, invest, they invest people that they, that they like or admire for whatever reason, with qualities that maybe they don't have. Yeah. You know, and then if they don't live up to them, whatever they may be, then they're deeply disappointed. They, res they, they feel betrayed, you know, all kinds of things. And it's, it's, uh, it's so it's a, it's a responsibility. You mentioned uh, George Harrison, who, who seems, you know, you. I know you you met him at times, and you also mentioned kind of him, you know his music um, later in in the book. Uh, but I did want to ask you about the idea because it kind of ties into this idea of being a fan. Um, you were clearly a fan of the Beatles, and yet you were also fa as famous as the Beatles, I, I would say. Um, and so you, and yet you met them, and it seems you were nervous when you met them. So what is that like? I mean, like you know, are you? In that moment, are you aware that you are a famous person, so you don't have to be nervous? You, do you know what I mean? Like, no, but I felt like every other teenager that was, you know, mad about the Beatles. I, I felt exactly like them. I played their records in my room and danced and sang and had pictures of them on the wall, and you know, uh, and so to meet them, it was. It was just the same. And I was madly in love with Elvis Presley that I never met him. And, you know, what I was doing and my, my particular fame had got absolutely nothing to do with it at all, except I realized, I appreciated the privileged position that I was in, that my mother could pick up the phone and go, hi, George, <laughs> you doing anything on Saturday night, you know? <laughs> I mean, which was wonderful and terrifying all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Could I, um, to, you know, before we finish, could I ask you a couple of like, just maybe some quick impressions about some of your more, more famous films? Like just if you have a fond memory or, you know, anything like that, an interesting anecdote, uh, uh, like The Parent Trap, for example. Do, do you have like a fond, particularly fond memory of making that film? You know, I was always surrounded by wonderful actors. And uh, in that film, I was, I worked with Maureen O'Hara and Brian Keith, Joanna Barnes, uh, Leo G. Carroll, who played the minister. And these people were actors that I adored. 
I loved watching them work. And I love good acting. I, I love actors. And, uh, and then when you meet people who are also <laughs> marvelous people, you know, that's the thing about actors, it's so lucky. We, we, we meet each other briefly for a play or a film and we have to get to know each other very quickly. And when you meet someone like Maureen O'Hara, who is warm and vibrant and beautiful and Irish and never stops talking and gives you a hug and, you know, within minutes you're laughing, um, it makes the work so much easier. So working with Maureen was the, the highlight for me of Parent Trap. I had a whole list of films here, but I'm going to I'm going to go I'm going to shorten it a little bit. Uh, the Trouble with Angels, which is not one yes. that is talked about quite as much as the Disney stuff, but I think that that film left an impression for a lot on a lot of people, young people um, who grew up with it. Do you have any any particular memories of making that one? Well, I I guess again it was because of, of a children kind of like thwarting adult uh, control and authority. Um, and I, of course, you know, working with Rosalind Russell was, <laughs> she was very intelligent and quite, and very imposing, but being also very tall and, and majestic when she had her nun's outfit on. And I was always a little bit in awe of her. And um, I, I, I think she thought that I, I was, I lacked respect because one day she, I was chatting to June Harding, who played my friend, and she walked past us. And I think I was still in the mode of, what was my name? Mary Clancy, I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that was my name. Yeah. And when she walked by, I stuck my tongue out very quickly which was a brave thing to do for Mary Clancy. And, I, and she caught it out of the corner of her eye. And I think she thought I didn't like her, uh, but I did. I did like her. I was, I was, I was quite in awe of her, but I've heard recently uh, or, or later that, that she thought I didn't like, and of course I did like her. Uh, uh, that was just a, a silly child being a silly child you know, uh, being brave. Look how brave and clever I am. I can stick my tongue out at the mother superior. So, I, and, and my regret is that I never got a chance to say, Ros, I adored you. Yeah. That wasn't me. That wasn't real. That was just, just a silly thing to do. Yeah. Wow. It's funny. It kind of mirrors the dynamic in the, up between the characters as well, I guess, uh, in that Mary is sort of, is she has that same kind of attitude towards the mother superior, but then ultimately regrets her behavior in the end. Yes. Um, so was the, would you say the family way was a, which you then made at the, I think it was the tail end of the contract or you had just finished the, um, at Disney perhaps. Uh, was that a, you know, was that a reaction to, to you, for you, do you think, to having been kind of, you know, stuck for lack of a better term in the Disney contract all those years where, where you finally were able to kind of go off and do a more adult type of picture? Yes, I thought The Family Way was the perfect film, the perfect part, you know, because I wanted to be, I wanted to be grown up. <laughs> I wanted to be a grown up. I wanted to play grown up people. Um, and as much as I loved working for Walt Disney and I loved him, uh, and the whole thing was wonderful and a very positive experience. And I wasn't exploited. Uh, I didn't have to deal with importunate producers or directors or anything like that. Um, there were things that I wanted to do that I couldn't. And uh, I, yeah, I, I wanted to take on challenges. And um, as an actress, I wanted to know what I could do. I, I, needed, I needed to find out what I could do. And the, the family way was a wonderful, I thought, this is it. I'm, I'm, I've left the bows on my, bows on my bum behind. Uh, this is a grown up person. In a yeah. grown up situation, 
you know, married and problems with the consummating the marriage and all those things. So it was wonderful. It was a one, yeah. and of course, with my dad. And I did a lot of pictures with my father. And some people have said they thought I did too many, but I loved working with him. And uh, he was such a a life affirming human being. Um, it was always a, a joyous experience. Um, and you know, what's wrong in choosing a job because you think you're going to have fun? <laughs> right. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> the, uh, the Flame Trees of Figa, which was sort of, you know, you advanced into playing a, you know, a obviously you were older at that point. Uh, it's a very different production. And that left a big impact on people here in the United States when, when it aired um, on the on PBS here on Masterpiece Theater. Um, you actually shot that on location, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, all of it. Yeah. Yeah, in, in East Africa, just outside Nairobi, in the, um, the uh, Nairobi National Park. And we were there for, for six months. Um, and I worked in Africa again uh, just a few years ago. And in 2008, I did a television series called Wild at Heart. Africa, you know, is such a an experience for one, for, for, you know, spiritually, <laughs> and uh, um, it, it was wonderful to to have the opportunity to spend so much time um, working there. I'm sure it was an amazing experience shooting there. For yes, it was. Uh, so, last one I'll ask you about then is uh, because you're giving me you're being so generous with your time. It's just uh, "Good Morning, Miss Bliss," which uh, obviously you you it wound up changing into it became "Saved by the Bell," which was a big thing here over here. Um, yeah. What was the, your experience like on that one, and, and why did you why did you wind up leaving that production? Well, um, I wound up leaving because they completely changed the format, they rewrote it. Instead of the focus of the series being Miss Brit Bliss, the focus of the series, they thought made more sense to be the children and their lives. So Miss Bliss got the elbow. Uh, <laughs> but while, while she was there, she enjoyed that experience very much indeed, um, because because it was fun, it was lovely working with the kids. And also, it was a completely different way of working. I'd never done that sitcom kind of thing. Although it didn't have an audience, we, we, we worked very rapidly. And while we were rehearsing, they were rewriting. And I'd heard people talking about this and thought, oh my God, that must be a nightmare. And now I was doing it, you know, and right up to to uh, recording, people were were coming up and what what we what used to happen is it would be like half a dozen people from head office with notepads running around after us while we were rehearsing the scenes, rewriting all our dialogue. You know, it was talk about doing something on the wing. Um, so that was quite, certainly kept you on your toes. And some people were absolutely brilliant at it. Whereas I know that, uh, you know, there were many times when I'd, I looked like that proverbial deer in headlights because I have no idea what was supposed to be coming next. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're doing yeah. a, re, a, a sequel to it now. Uh, they should bring Miss Bliss back for a guest episode, I think. Like, oh my God. <laughs> Staggering old Lady <laughs> Methuselah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last question, Haley. Uh, uh, the book kind of, you know, reaches a certain point and then you kind of finish. And it seems to me that there's plenty more story to tell. Would you consider writing a, uh, another book, a sequel? Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm so in the kind of the maelstrom of, of of it now, uh, I tell you one thing though, the process. I I 
I miss the sitting down every day and, you know, even if it's torture and you just feel you're staring at a brick wall that goes up, you know, endlessly and to the left and right, you don't have any idea how you're going to get around it. Um, but I, I, I love the process. I love it. And I think it's a, amazing that, that, um, that this book exists at all. And of course it wouldn't if it wasn't for my son, Crispian. Um, and uh, I don't know if he could face going down that rabbit hole with me again. And also the next book would be very different. I wanted to finish it there because I really felt when I had my two sons, Crispian and Ace, that no more excuses now. I was grown up and uh, I really had to take responsibility for my life and that's it. And that doesn't mean that I just sailed through and didn't make any mistakes after that. Quite the opposite. And um, I might, I don't know, I'd have to find a way through that particular labyrinth. Sure, okay, well, no rush. But, you know, we'll, we'll keep our eyes open for it just in case. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again. It's really, it's, it's so thrilling to talk to you. I re really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Haley. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Haley. Good. Have Lovely a, to talk to you. Likewise. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Well, we decided that we wanted to spend our, our camp out together. So whichever one of us is Sharon, and we won't tell, whichever one of us is Sharon, we're not going to Boston. Hmm. Now, don't get smart with me, girls. Sharon, go right upstairs and put your suit on now. Go on. Are you sure she's Sharon? Of course she is.